And welcome once again to another edition of Footnotes. We're looking forward today to talking with you about Jedi mind tricks. Now, I know some of you have already tuned out. You're like, what is a Jedi and what do you mean about mind tricks? And Brady, you're a big Star Wars fan, yes, right? Sir. You have the bed sheets, the curtains. I don't know about that. And the underwear, right? Mm, no? Justin, no. is that you? Yes. Okay. Lightsabers, um, the land speeder for the bed, all that stuff. Well, I will be honest. I think I had the bed sheets, and I think I had the blanket, and I had E.T. curtains. Ooh. I had yeah. Lego sets of Star Wars. That's what I had. Really? Mm-hmm. So uh, back in my day, the E.T. curtains. Pretty <laughs> sure they stayed in my room until high school. I just forgot about them. And then one day I was like, probably should take these E.T. curtains down. <laughs> Not the vibe we're going for anymore. Yeah, you know, you just don't notice. I didn't notice curtains. I wish I still had the E.T. curtains. But anyway. It's amazing. We're going to be talking about Jedi mind tricks. Now, what are Jedi mind tricks, Brady, you may ask? Well, if you've uh, seen Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope, when... Uh Ben Kenobi waves his hand in front of a stormtrooper and says, these are not the droids you're looking for. And the stormtrooper goes, these are not the droids I'm looking for. And basically, like, controls his mind to not see what's right in front of his face and kind of pulls a fast one on him, so to speak. That was kind of using the force to confuse someone and get away uh, from So it's tricking someone with something that you say. Yes. And so what we want to encourage the listener to do today, we're going to give you some common phrases Christians try to use to get out of accountability. Hmm. Okay, so we've been reading a book by Jonathan Lehman uh, on biblical authority. Uh, We've really enjoyed the book. We highly recommend it to you, and I'm sure you'll be able to get a copy in the book nook, and we'll put a link at the bottom of the podcast. But it got us thinking about how we're all under biblical authority. We're all under the authority of God, the church, the Spirit, And people try to use phrases sometimes to get out of authority. And as pastors, we witness that, sadly, more than you would imagine. So what they're doing is they're trying to play Jedi mind tricks on us. But like in episode one of Star Wars, arguably the worst Star Wars, (laughs) well, no, I think seven. Was it seven, Timothy, or eight? What was the dumpster fire? Eight. Eight was the dumpster fire. <laughs> that was bad. the absolute, I mean, just burn that one. But one comes kind of right in behind it. But there's this character, Watto, stupid character. There, <laughs> Most of them are in episode one. And uh, he says, your Jedi mind tricks don't work on me. So that's always been my goal. When Christians try to get out of biblical authority with these phrases, I want to look back and say, no, nah, that doesn't work. So what we want to do today is help you think through some of these common phrases that people use to get out of biblical authority and encourage you not to use those phrases and tell you why they would be wrong, right? So let's jump into the phrases. Five phrases we're going to talk through that we have heard over the course of our life. I may have even said some of these Mm. phrases in my life, okay? Phrase number one, Jedi mind trick number one. People will say after they've left the church for maybe a few weeks or a month or whatever, and you contact them because you've noticed they've been gone, right? You're trying to do your pastoral duty to go after the sheep or whatever. They'll often say this little line right here. Well, no one noticed that I was gone. Now, see, that's a Jedi mind trick. Eh, Doesn't work on me. Now, why would that not need to work on anybody? Let's talk about that. What do you think, guys? Yeah, well, I mean, as a church member, you, you know, made a covenant to the church body that you're a part of, and it's not so much, you know, yes, we want to look for our members and notice when they're gone, but also a person has the responsibility that if they're leaving the church to tell the pastors, to tell the church, hey, we're, we're leaving for this reason, we're moving, we're doing this or that, and it's not just only our responsibility to look for someone, it's they have a responsibility too, and so I think we were talking earlier, you know, if a family member just disappeared, You know, if if your dad just left and just didn't come home after work, you didn't see him for a week. I mean, yes, the family would be like, where is dad? But it's also the dad's responsibility. Like he's not off the hook just from disappearing. And well, no one contacted me. No one, you know, no one looked for me like, yes, we did. We were looking for you. (laughs) Yeah. And so there's a responsibility. No one, no (laughs) one missed me. I'm like, are you kidding? What are you talking about? 
So it's not that we wouldn't go after these people, but realistically, sometimes you don't know people are gone until months later. Now, why is that? Let's talk about that. Let's be fair, right? Why would we not maybe notice somebody's gone for a month or two? Anybody want to tackle that one? There's a real obvious reason. Yeah, so what, what's your commitment? People. Right? What is, what is your commitment personally to the church and, and as your family? Are you involved? Are you serving? Are you making a point to come when, when we're worshiping together as a family? You know, ultimately, if you're not doing that, it's going to be difficult to tell. And the whole, the whole thing is subjective. Do I notice and need to contact you after you're gone for one week or two weeks? Is there a time limit on that? Were you sick? Were you on vacation? When you say no one noticed I was gone, was it that really literally no one in the church knew or just not the right people? You know, because we should be checking on one another. We should be spurring one another on to good works and to love. But at what point do you say I'm responsible to show up, to be involved, to be committed to the church and honor my commitments to that covenant that I've made as a church member. Exactly. Yeah. If you if you started hunting people, I mean, number one, we have some people, not to be rude, but they're here about once a month anyway, and they they think that's faithful. Now, I don't know where they are the rest of the month, but they're here one hour, once a month, and if they were to say, well, nobody noticed I was gone, you're right. We barely notice when you're here. I mean, I'm not being rude. I'm just being honest. Now, let's, let's take another member. I'll call this member out. We notice when she's not here. It happened this week. Jackie Crone. Yep. Okay. She, she and, and George went to see family. And what was the first thing you said to me? You said, you know, Jackie wasn't here. I need to call her. And so you did. Yeah. And she said, oh, I forgot to tell you we're going to be visiting family. Now, why would we notice Jackie Crone is gone? Because she and George are here faithfully every time the doors are open. Now, does that mean you have to emulate that? Well, no, not necessarily. But we're, we're going to notice people that come on Wednesday night when they're not here. We're going to notice people that are in discipleship groups when they don't show up for D groups. We're going to notice people who don't come to home group. We're going to notice people that, you know, are consistently not with us. But then there's this whole group of people, and you have to decide, do we discipline these people? And there are some churches that would. They would say, your name is off the roll. Um, now, we've not gotten there yet, but, you know, I don't know that we would. But there's a church right down the street, and they have a policy. Now, they're a Baptist church, but they have a policy. If you miss more than two weeks— then you are, I think I heard, you were telling me this, Justin. Was it you? I don't think so, but I'm, I'm interested now. Oh, I know who it was. I know who it was. Mm. I won't say. It was Carl. Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, was telling me that if you miss more than two weeks at this church right down the road here, that they will dis- they will remove your, I, I don't know if that's wow. true. That's intense. I believe, I believe the guy who told me. But that's what I thought, it, while we were having some conversation, he said, well, you know what they would do? Like, no. And he said that. And I was like, oh, wow, that's intense. You know? Yeah, maybe that's the extreme I mean, side. Good for but, them. Yeah, but certainly whatever. your absence should be out of the ordinary. That shouldn't be a regular pattern that, well, so and so's gone. Well, but they've been gone at four baseball tournaments and three vacations. And not to say any of those things in and of themselves are, are bad all the time. But you know what your track record is. I mean, you, you know if you're a person that's faithful to, to the church or not faithful to the church. And you can, try to, you can try to use a Jedi mind trick and say, well, and we'll get there later and talk about some of these other ways that people think they're worshiping on the, the baseball field or here or there. But you know what your commitment is. And if you're one of those people that really it's not out of the ordinary for you to be gone, then how are we going to miss you? How, how, we- how will we know? Right. I think of two particular cases in the last four years— so some time has gone through, and hopefully, you know, I'm not calling anybody out, but I, I think this one particular situation, we had a family, and I noticed they weren't coming as much, and we reached out to the family, and they told us, oh, we've just been busy, and so that's what they told us. We would tell people when they would ask, we'd say, yeah, we reached out to them. Well, then pops up they've disappeared right they just left the church they left their covenant commitment they walked out and when we reached back out because we had heard 
through the grapevine, oh, yeah, they, they've gone to this other church. Well, we thought, well, now, wait a minute. We had just talked to them, and they didn't tell us that. And then we reached back out to them, and the, the, the message back was, you know, we care about you. No, you don't. Well, well how, in the, how in the world, why would we not care about you? We're trying to reach out to you. Another example, this guy, you know, kind of disappears with his family, and I kind of notice, and I reach out. I mean, it had been a couple of weeks, you know, and it was summer. And I reached out, and I said, hey, I've noticed y'all aren't coming. What, what's going on? And he said, well, I'm not trying to be rude, but nobody noticed that we were gone. Nobody reached out to us. And I just said right back, you know what? That's that's not true. I said, number one, I do know people that have reached out to you. Secondly, I mean, I'm reaching out to you. And thirdly, you're the one that made the covenant with the church. So look, I love you. If, if God's leading you somewhere else, that's fine. I mean, we want you to go. We want to respect you out the door, but please don't blame it on us, right? I mean, we, we, we can't know what we don't know. So there's always people that are going to try to use the Jedi mind. Well, nobody noticed I was gone. Well, did you tell anybody? Did you come to the pastors and say, I'm going to go visit around? A lot of people don't want to do that. They just disappear. Right. Uh, there was a there was a podcast. I I don't know the episode number. Timothy, you'll have to look it up. But we talked about that. Not we, but the pastors had talked about that. Um, how, what's the right way to leave the church? And the right way is not to fall off the face of the earth and ghost everyone, and then try to flip that responsibility back on the church. Ultimately, you have to take responsibility for that. Yeah, and I think that's the main thrust of what we're trying to say in this first mind trick. You know, it's not wrong to leave a church. You know, if God is leading you somewhere else your pastors always want to help you but it is wrong to flip it like you said and turn it on the church and point the finger and say well it's your fault well that may not be true it could be true who knows you know we're dealing with situations but generally you're the covenant member Mm -hmm. you came into covenant uphold your end of the covenant right so if i'm if if you know i'm a dad in your example brady and i'm going to walk out well it's my responsibility to say okay dad's leaving you know i'm not going to be here i'm just gone otherwise what would we say about that dad he's worthless right he just left just walked out didn't love his family yeah well he'd probably be worthless anyway if he's just (laughs) going to leave his family but anyway that's a bad illustration but it's hypothetical okay that's jedi mind trick number one don't use that well, nobody noticed I was gone. All right, so because that was heavy, let me give you um, some other sayings Christians usually give. Um, here it is. God grades on the cross, not the curve. Amen. Amen. All right, that's just a little happy saying for you. All right, Jedi mind trick number two, Timothy. We get this a lot. God told me, or you could vice versa that, I feel God wants me okay now it's not wrong that we would believe god told us something right but let's talk about why this could be a mind trick yeah well first off god speaks to us through his word and that's the primary way that he's revealed himself to us and certainly doesn't discount i know that as Christians, we are indwelt by, with the Holy Spirit. We are spirit-led, but the Spirit should lead us through and to God's Word. And if we can't test or check or speak into whatever that thing is that God told you or that you feel with Scripture, then that's a problem. How, how can we actually check that? Because why would God tell you and not tell me? It's the same Spirit, right? We're, we're both in the same faith, serving the same God, saved the same way, we should both be accountable to that same scripture and that same word. And certainly the ways that we are led by scripture, that's going to be applied differently, but it's dangerous when we start to say that God told us something and we can't go and, and check that against the biblical principles that we see in scripture. Yeah, it's basically a way to do whatever you want to do without any kind of pushback, right? If God told me to do something, that is the divine mandate from almighty God and you can't question it. So it's like, I don't want to engage with you. I don't want to hear your opinion. I don't want to hear any advice. I want to do what I'm going to do. And I'm I'm going to blame God on it basically. So a lot of times this happens like in relationships, right? When people are like, yeah, this isn't working out. God told me I need to dump you or something. And you're not really dealing with honestly what the issues are. You're just kind of blaming God for 
your decision and then the person can't say anything about it because well god told me to dump you so <laughs> <laughs> right it wasn't you were a creep it, god, god told me that yeah, yeah it wasn't yeah. anything it wasn't yeah. the prettier person that i'm now going to start <laughs> dating it was the lord yeah. yeah the lord well and and again do, does god speak through the word and through the holy spirit to his children i would say yes should we expect the lord to lead us yes there is some subjective element to it but you have to be very careful this can become a mind trick that you try to use on other people to get what you want so uh i remember when i was in college uh, there was a young man and he announced to our bible class that god was was telling him to go and pastor this church that was down in somewhere Arkansas, you know, some little bitty town, Justin, like where you're from, Ashdown or Bono. Right, or Possum Ra- Grape. Rosum number, <laughs> rising number two. But anyway, God was going to call him down to one of these places, and we had a professor at our college, uh, Dr. Ron Mitchell, who is now with the Lord, godly man, um, well thought out in Scripture, challenged his students, and he challenged this young man. He said, I don't think you ought to do that. You're not ready. You're too young. And, you know, God has called you first to come to this college and get an education. And you need to you need to do that. And then when you're done with that, then God can call you, you know, wherever. So his point was, didn't you already feel called to come to this college and train and all that? So, you know, that was, well, but God told me. So the kid goes down, right, and he lasts about three months. That's typical. And what does he get up in front of the church and say when it doesn't work out? God is what? Leading me to go back to Conway and finish my studies. Of course, Dr. Mitchell would would never let anybody off the hook. And so he said... So God's changed his mind, huh? <laughs> I mean, God changed his mind in four months. And, <laughs> and you know, that was a lesson to all of us yeah. because we watched this guy go through it, and we learned, don't use that cop out. If you just want to say, look, I just want to go pastor this church, and I'm tired of school. I'm just going to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. And this is an opportunity, and can God use it? Yes. Fine, just be honest. But to to blame it on the Lord and then to say, well, now God's leading me to do this. You know, God sure is a mind-changing God, isn't he? Yeah, we like to God, blame God for our decision-making when we have to bear that responsibility. Like, we yes, we want to prayerfully seek the Lord and his word, but there's a lot of decisions we make that aren't— there's not a Bible verse that tells you who to marry, where to work, where to live. And so you've got to make these decisions, and we like to just kind of blame it on God instead of just saying, hey— I think this is the best decision. I've prayed, I prayed to search the scriptures, and I'm going to take ownership of this this decision that we like to pawn well, it off. And my thing about that, about well, God led me. Okay, maybe, but God also puts you in a church with other believers, hmm. and He puts you under authority. And so, have you gone and sought counsel? And isn't that what Scripture commands us to do? Proverbs teaches us, you know. Plans fail for the lack of counsel. So it's my responsibility. If I think I'm going to do something and God is leading me, I'm going to go talk to people. And I'm going to talk to my pastors. You know, that's you guys. I'm submitting myself to you and saying, well, what do you think about this? You know, case in point, when I came to Broadway four years ago, what did I do? Well, we had a council of pastors, right, that were in the church there in Texas. I I sat them down months before and said, this church has reached out to me. Um, Would you pray with me about this? And they walked me through it. They talked with me. They gave me counsel. I mean, one of them, you know, I even recorded his counsel. I videoed him so that I could watch it again. And they would ask good questions like, you know, if you don't do this, are you going to regret it? You know, those are good questions. Well, you know, is the church at the right place for this? Can you leave us and we be okay? And they asked a lot of good questions. And and then on the final day, 
uh, right before we came in via the call, I sat down with them in a room, my office, and we were having our pastor's meeting. It was Monday, 3 o'clock, and I said, all right, guys, this is it. I mean, I'm either going to go in view of a call or I'm not, and I want you to go around the room, and I want everybody to give me a yes or no, should I go, and if I get one no, I'm not going, and I said, I'm not putting this on you. I'm just, you're my pastors, and if one of you think this is a bad idea from the church's standpoint, right, then I don't need to go. I need to be submissive. And so we went around the room, and every one of them was like, yes, please leave yesterday. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's get rid of you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> they, they did go around the room, and they were all like, yes. And, and, and I said, now give me a reason. And they would say things like, well, I think we're healthy. I think there's multiple pastors. I think Aaron over here can lead us for the next year. I think you've brought us to a place where we're good. And so everybody went around the room. And I said, okay, well, with your blessing, I'm going to go in view of a call. But plans fail for lack of counsel. So have I done that? Yes. In my life, I've done that. Should I? Should you do that? Yes, you should do that. That's what I'd say. I mean, what do y'all think? Instead of, well, God told me. You know, we, we so often forget the community aspect of our faith. You know, we, we enjoy our freedom. We, we always think about our own personal relationship with Jesus, which we should, and our own personal holiness. But we forget a lot, at least uh, functionally in our decisions, we are part of a body. If, you know, if you have joined in covenant with Broadway, you are part of this body and you are an essential part of this body. You know, I, I joke with the students all the time and say, you don't see hands just running around being hands by themselves. This isn't the Adams family. It doesn't work that way. But we do treat our own faith and experiences that way. Well, God told me it doesn't matter what you have to say. It doesn't matter what kind of chaos you're going to leave in, in, in your wake. This is what I'm going to do. And we forget that we are part of that body. And we should, it doesn't mean that I'm going to come over and say, Mark, I think you should wear these pants tomorrow. And we're not going to be necessarily micro involved in every decision, but we should weigh our decisions against the totality of of that body that we're a part of, especially those that we respect, our leaders, our pastors, and those that uh, are going to pour that godly wisdom into us. And at the end of the day, we should be more confident in our decision once we've been tested, once we've gone through those conversations. Like you said, we may not agree, but at least I've thought about it from every possible angle before I go take another church or take another job or make this life-altering and life-changing decision. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, there's a great line in Hunt for Red October, and Fred, uh, what's his name from Tennessee, was a senator, Fred. What, what is it, Timothy? What was his name? He was an actor. Fred Thompson. Fred Thompson. Thank you, Timothy. <laughs> Timothy's like, who? <laughs> actor Fred Thompson's playing this Navy captain or something, you know, on this aircraft carrier where, where uh, Alex... Uh, Alex, what's his name? Baldwin comes on board. Hunt for Red. Have y'all seen this movie? Why are y'all looking Alec, at me? Alec I've Baldwin, seen bits and pieces. Alex Ball, okay. yeah, Alec Baldwin, no. Sean, Sean, Sean Connery. This is, this, Connery. Is, this is one of the best movies ever made. It's a good movie. I'll pray about that. Yeah, wait. <laughs> he says, son, the Russians don't do anything without a plan. And he says something else. They don't go to the bathroom without a plan. But I've always taken that line and I've thought, Fred Thompson is right. Don't do anything without a plan. It may not be the best plan. But get counsel and and don't just do things from the hip, you know. So I'm always going to people saying, what do you think about this? I don't think I ever make a decision without talking to somebody else. And mm. that's just a wise thing to do. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the next one. And you mentioned it. The next Jedi mind trick is, oh, wait, before the next Jedi mind trick, let me give you a fun Christian saying. Are you ready, Timothy? And I'm going to need an amen on this, okay? I'm ready. Because people, people are going to want this to be sermon titles in the future. Don't let your worries get the best of you. Remember, Moses started out as a basket case. Amen. 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 Can't you just hear a that? basket case? One cross, three nails, four given. <laughs> all right. Uh, let's these are all Southern on. Gospel songs, Yeah, these right? are Southern Gospel oh, uh, sermon titles. All right, moving on to the Jedi mind, tr mind tricks. Uh, number four. Number four, I'll pray about it. Mm. Now, there's nothing wrong with praying. Mm. You should pray about it. But some people use this as a mind trick to get out of authority. Mm. I'll pray about it. 
Now, I jokingly say that around here all the time. And my <laughs> kids have started using it. So, like, you guys will ask me a question, and I'll go, um, I don't know, we need to pray about that. You know, like, you know, should we should we spend that? I don't know, we better pray about that. And that's just kind of code word for no. <laughs> right, no, I'm not going to ever think about that again. <laughs> and so my kids have started doing that to me. And I'll say, y'all need to do the dishes. And Mike will say, I don't know, I'm going to pray about that, Dad. I'm like, well, you better pray hard while you do the dishes. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> so that, you know, they pick up our sin mm. that we do. But uh, people have used this. Let's talk about this. Mm-hmm. I'll pray about it. And and what's your response to that? Why would we say that could be a Jedi mind trick? Well, it can kind of become a spiritual smokescreen if we're actually not going to really consider whatever is being asked of us and actually really pray about it. I've heard somebody, I can't remember who it was, really say you should never say, I'll pray about it. You should just pray. You, should, you shouldn't tell someone you're going to pray. You should pray, either with them or, or actually pray about that decision. And so when it's used in a kind of a, you're, you're being asked to do something and you're like, it's a, a spiritual sounding kind of nonsense. If you're not actually going to pray, it's just like, it sounds good, right? It always sounds good to say, I'll pray about it. But if you actually don't really pray about it or come back to that or really consider it, then you're, you're just saying empty words, right? You're not letting your yes be yes or your no be no. You're just saying some spiritual, magical words and then kind of eliminating your responsibility from it. Yeah, certainly. I think that's the first thing. Are you actually going to pray about it? And then secondly, do you need to pray about it? Is the Bible crystal clear that this is something you should do Mm. or should not do? Well, I I don't think you should cheat on your wife. Well, I'll, I'll pray about it. What? No, we would never say something that ridiculous because we know that that is a sinful thing. We should not do that. Or, you know, I, I don't know if I should give any tithes or offerings. I'm going to pray about that. Well, maybe you need to pray about how much, what that looks like, how faithful you can be. But again, the Bible's pretty clear on, on so many things that we don't need to muddy it up by pretending it's something that we need to seek additional spiritual counsel on. You know, we don't need to make confusing something that God has already made very clear. Yeah, sometimes you don't need to pray, you need to obey. There is, right. there is no praying to be had. It's black and white right there in Scripture. So you need to obey is the right response, not I'll pray about it. It's like, no, you're actually in disobedience right now. You need to repent and obey. <laughs> right, that should yeah. be your prayer, a prayer of confession <laughs> yeah. and repentance. Yeah, very yes. true. Yes. I remember years and years ago, decades ago, I was counseling a couple and one particular person of the couple was in an adulterous affair. And I told them, this is what the Lord commands you as a believer, a professed believer, you know, radical amputation of your sin. Jesus said, if, if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. If your arm, cut it off. So I said, here's what you need to do. You need to gouge out this relationship, cut off communications, And after all that in just clear instruction, I felt like this person looks back with their spouse sitting next to them and said, well, I'm going to have to pray about that. And I said, oh, no, you don't. You just need to do it. I mean, you can pray, but God is not going to go against his word. And, you know, adultery is one of the Ten Commandments, and this is very clear. And so there's no need for you to pray. There's just a need for you to do it right now. And, you know, they didn't do it. They went out and did their own thing. And in the name of prayer, Mm. well, I've got to go pray. So it is a smokescreen to stall Mm. and get out of a situation sometimes. Now, again, we should always pray without ceasing. We should make prayer a matter of the Christian life. But we can't use that. Yeah, it's like instead of blaming God when you say, I feel God told me when you say, I got to pray about it. Now you're blaming prayer. That's, that's like yeah. you're, you're blaming that instead of just, yes, you should pray, but you can't use prayer as an excuse to disobey God's word. Well, and again, how could anybody question that? Yeah. I mean, pretty much everything we've talked about, it's meant to get you, the inquirer, to not be able to question. Mm. You know, they don't want to be accountable or under authority. And yet the Bible says the one another's in Scripture are very real. We are to hold one another accountable. We are to rescue one another from sin. We are to, you know, strengthen one another. I I can't do that if you're going to try to turn this constantly on me and shut me down. You know, well, I'll pray about that. Smoke screen, right? Mm -hmm. So don't use that. Don't use that. Okay, um, time for another fun saying. You ready? I think this could be a a good sermon title one day. You guys ready? 
Ready. How did Jesus' crucifixion save us? It's because he nailed it. Amen. Boom. Amen. <laughs> Amen. It's going to be a good series. You like these, Timothy? Do you? That was good. I like, thought Brady uh, had a good one. Meant, don't pray, obey. You need to submit that yeah, to the don't list. Don't pray, obey. Don't pray, obey. It even rhymes. I, I like that. Yeah. Uh, what car did Jesus drive? A Chrysler. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. That's the worst oh, one, by the way. Dear. Yeah. Well, okay. Whatever. <laughs> I'm just trying to balance the heavy <laughs> with the light. I'll pray about that. It's kind of like whiplash. I'll pray about <laughs> that. All right, let's go to number. Um, wait, I think I got the numbers off. Timothy's shaking his head. I did. So number one, no one noticed I was gone. Number two, God told me, or I feel. Number three, I'll pray about it. Number four, I can worship God in the blank. I don't have to be at church. I can worship God in the deer stand. I can worship God in the hot tub. I can worship God on the ball field. I don't know what you want to put in the blank. Mm. Is that a smoke screen? Yeah, because no one ever said you can't worship in there, but you're making a, a conscious decision and effort to not worship where you're commanded to. You're forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. Typically, that what that gets used when, you know, I had to be out, had to, um, in quotes, had to be out, of Sunday service or this responsibility or this gathering and this worship because I needed to spend another weekend at a baseball tournament or another weekend on vacation or the favorite Arkansas one. Maybe it was in Texas this way too. Another weekend in the deer stand. Well, listen, from October till July, you're not going to see me because I got to feed my family every single weekend for the rest of my life. And you're like, what? What's going on? So it, can you worship God there? Yeah, we should be worshiping God every single place we go. But does it have to be when the church is supposed to be gathered together to worship as a community? No. And so it's it's just putting two things against one another that shouldn't be. Yeah. yeah it's what a very individualistic. Well, a lot of these are very individualistic. Like, I don't want the counsel of the church. I don't want to listen to the pastors. I want to this is, again, well, you need the church, right? Worship is not just you out in nature. Yes, that you can worship God in nature, but church is a lot more than just you worshiping in a room with just that happens to have other people in it. Like, you have to serve one another. We sing and, and encourage one another with our singing. We check on people. We use our gifts. We hear the preaching of the word. Like those are things you can't do in a deer stand. The deer aren't going to preach to you. You know, they're, they're not going to pray with you and for you. And so you're missing out on so much more. It's not just you individually worshiping God. That's not, he wants you to be part of the body, right? Like the hand cut off in the forest. Well, that's not a body, right? That's some hand that I left in the woods and the, you know, and so we need to be with other believers to really be the church, right? Assembling together, which we've talked about on different podcasts, the importance of gathering together in many ways. And so using that as a cop out and saying, well, I can worship God just as well in the deer stand. Uh, you can't be a church member just as well in the deer stand. You may be able to worship God anywhere, but you can't obey the commandments of God just anywhere. You need to be with the gathered believers. And we would know that if someone said, I can love my wife in the deer stand. Well, yeah, but at some point you have to go home and see her, right? And I can <laughs> love my kids got, in the deer stand. There's got to be a relationship. Yeah. 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 And I think that's a good point. I mean, our Christianity is not individualistic and isolationist. It is yes. a body. We are part of the body of Christ. Every member that God sends us is an integral part of that body, and we want to love them and serve them to the best of our ability. We do that imperfectly. We don't always catch everything, but that's why you have the body. It's not just the pastors. Hmm. That's what always gets me. People say, well, how's this person doing? You get that a lot, Brady. Yes. And we want to just look back and say, I don't know, you can visit them as much as I can. I mean, I will visit them, but yes. how about you call and you visit? Because it's the whole body, right? They don't just need to hear from us. They need to hear from all of you. Um, we will see them and we will minister to them. But what an encouragement if they get 10 phone calls. Hmm. I just feel loved by the body. And many times that happens. People will say, Broadway has just been so good and blessed me so much i've been just encouraged and that's what we want as pastors because yep. it's a good thing yeah all right so i think we've exhausted that one i have another good fun little sermon title here timothy get ready didn't go to church today instead i stayed home and listened to rem guess i'm losing my religion amen 
y'all, y'all know that song? I, I do. Losing my religion. Yeah. Some some people. What? That's a competition what for the Chrysler. Rim? Those are oh, neck man. and neck for worst one right now. My biggest fear is being trapped in a small room with Santa. I have claustrophobia. <laughs> These are oh these goodness. are ridiculous. Oh my! This is just a Google search for good sermons on the internet, oh and that's what I found. Yikes! Being right. trapped in a small room with Santa—that's an interesting Yikes. take. <laughs> you know those people our... using Bibles on their phones? They're using phony Bibles. <laughs> you like that, Timothy? Timothy actually laughed on that one pretty good. Very good. All oh right. Oh my! I'm glad I can do what I can. All right, let's move to Jedi mind trick number five. So the fifth one, and Justin, you brought this one up. I'm not gifted in that area. What does that mean? Right. So you'll hear, you'll hear. Well, God hasn't gifted me this way. God hasn't called me to that. I, you know, I, I, I don't know. You'll hear it a, a few different ways, but those are probably the main two. And a lot of times, it's not something specific. Sometimes it's not. Am I gifted to go teach, or am I gifted to go do this very specific task? It's I haven't I don't have the spiritual gift of giving, so I'm not going to give any. I don't have the spiritual gift of mercy, so I can just cuss people out and say whatever I want. You know, God's gifted me to be a prophet, so I can just be mean to everybody. And you hear some of the well, God hasn't gifted me this certain way, and certainly we have spiritual giftings for the edification of the body, the building up of one another together. But God also has called us to a certain standard, just across the board. And again, this is one of those things that gets said in place of being obedient here's a clear command to be obedient to god through his word and we want to try to confuse that by saying well i don't have that very particular spiritual gifting so or talent so i'm not going to do it and it's another spiritual cop-out yeah and sometimes i mean obeying is hard and so yeah it may not come naturally that's because we're sinners you know and it's not 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 necessarily because you weren't gifted it's because we're sinners and you don't want to give or to serve or You know, because we struggle with the flesh. And so, yeah, using gifting as a cop-out to not obey just doesn't work when you think about it. You're like, yeah, you may not be gifted to maybe preach a sermon every Sunday, but you're still called to speak the truth. You're still called to edify your brother and sister in Christ. And you're still called to do all kinds of things that all believers are called to, like you said, not just certain ones because of their gifting. Right. So. Well, right. And, you know, God gives spiritual gifts, I believe, that aren't the same thing as your natural gifting, and he gives it to people to meet the needs of the body. And I think we've kind of said that, but I just want to point that out. The best, you know, item I ever heard on that was Henry Blackaby in Experiencing God talked about, you know, that was probably one of the best things of that book was that God doesn't necessarily just give you one spiritual gift forever, for all time. I mean, what if you're in a church and there aren't enough teachers but God could give you the gift of teaching temporarily maybe you know or what if there's no youth director and you could fill that void could God give you the gift of ministering to people yes yes just be willing to be obedient Hmm. and I think that's the key you know we don't have to I think that's a cop out well you know I don't want to work with kids so I'm not gifted to work with kids I'm not saying everybody should work with kids some of you you shouldn't and that's a good thing, you know. You know that, and we're thankful you do. But again, if we go into it with a heart of, mm-hmm. I want to meet needs, and God has me in this body for a reason, and it might not be what I'm great at or whatever, but I'm willing. I'm willing to do whatever, mm. and that's key. Yeah. Well, that's just the heart of a servant versus kind of picking and choosing how I will serve Jesus. Like, if he's your Lord, he's your Lord, right? Like, a servant doesn't go, you know, Master— I much rather prefer, you know, taking care of the sheep. I really hate the donkeys. I don't want to take care of them. I'm not gifted that way. You know, it's like that sounds preposterous. You know, if we were telling Jesus some of these things, like if Jesus calls us to do something, we ought to do it willingly, humbly, you know, with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And so it's like when we use those kind of cop-outs, that just doesn't work. If he's your Lord, he's your Lord. And if he calls you and commands you to do something, we do it. You know, we don't say, well, I'm not really gifted in that way, Jesus. It's like that doesn't really work. Yeah, it goes back to what you said earlier. It's a selfish take on our faith. We approach it like it's a buffet, and I'll take this part that I like and this part that I like. I'll serve in this area because I want to. I'm not going to serve in that one because I don't want to. And, and you know, we have to nuance it, I guess, because we, we can't all do all the things all the time, but we should have that willingness to yeah, say, you know, God, 
if you are supremely in charge, if you are the authority, if you are the Lord of my life, then are we going to really submit in every single area? And that means showing up and, and running a petting zoo if we need a petting zoo, or showing up and helping in the nursery if we need someone to help in the nursery. Even if that's not your favorite thing, you know, you're going to put the body above your own needs. Mm. A great point. So these are Jedi mind tricks. Sometimes believers use these to get out of authority and to get out of accountability. Our hope is that you've heard these, you've been challenged to carefully use them. And I say that because I would not say don't use any of them, right? You should pray about it. Sometimes God does lead you. You know, sometimes you do need to be somewhere else. But just be very wise and discerning how you would say these things. Because I'll say this, other believers instantly know when you are doing this to get out of something. I mean, it's very obvious. They're not going to maybe say that back to you, but it's obvious when you're trying to use that to, you know, manipulate the situation, right? No. Yeah. All right. Well, on that note, we hope that we've encouraged you today. I'm going to give one more one-liner. Are you ready? Are you ready? Great one. Atheism is a non-profit organization. Amen. 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 And on that note, we take our Jedi mind tricks and we say it doesn't work on us. And we continue to do pastoral ministry. We'll see you next time on Footnotes. Footnotes.